And now joining us on Book TV is Professor Maurice Jackson here at Georgetown University. He is the author of this book, Let This Voice Be Heard, Anthony Benizé, Father of Atlantic Abolition Abolitionism. Professor Jackson, who was Anthony Benizé? Thank you for having me. Uh, Anthony Benizé was <clears throat> born a Huguenot in, in France in 1713. Uh, uh, because of religious intoleration, the Edict of Nantes had been revoked in 1685, and that edict had given uh, non-Catholics uh, uh, some religious uh, freedom. The uh, edict is revoked in 1685, and people like the Protestant Huguenots uh, are forced to leave, either leave or convert. And so his family chose uh, 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 to leave. Uh, his family was a very prominent family in the uh, north of France, had been a linen merchants. But his father, uh, he tells the story of, uh, of leaving uh, France and going to the border <coughs> and trying to pass through uh, Holland. And uh, the guards tried to stop, stop them. And so uh, his father said, in this hand, I have a pouch of money. In this hand, I have a pistol. You take your choice. And the guard, as, we, as you or I would do, took the, uh, uh, took the cash. The family uh, uh, fled uh, France that way, went to uh, England and settled in England for some years. And remarkably, this Benizé uh, studied uh, at the same school learning English as did Voltaire. And of course, the great Voltaire uh, was as far from a Quaker or from a religious uh, tolerant a person as you could imagine. He was a man of, of great, uh, of great uh, uh, abundance of, uh, of material goods and things like that. But he became fascinated with the, uh, 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 with the Quakers uh, too, or with the lifestyle of this uh, uh, Benizé. Benizé is because he had been a Huguenot and because of the Huguenot's uh, oppression, because his family had been <coughs> uh, members of something uh, called the Camisards, which were mountain revolutionaries in France, and had been part of something else called the Inspirees, uh, and something else called the Congeny uh, Quakers, uh, his family had, uh, had, 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 had for many years understood the nature of uh, freedom and oppression and how to fight uh, that, that said uh, oppression. So he came to, uh, uh, as he came from England, he had a great knowledge of the world already. His what family year did he come to the States? Came to the United States uh, uh, in 1731. Uh, 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 <coughs> and as he came to the United States, uh, he had lived in, uh, in, uh, in England some years. But his father was a merchant, and he didn't find the businesses uh, that he wanted to in, uh, in England. And he came to America uh, and settled in Philadelphia, where he became a successful businessman. Uh, the young Benizé, Anthony Antoine, uh, was of slight of uh, a bill, uh, sort of sickly, and he had no interest in the, the, what he called the buying and selling of goods, his, his, uh, uh, which is what his uh, uh, father did. And very quickly, he, uh, he uh, used his knowledge. He, is, he was a multilingual, uh, and his desire of, uh, for books and, and became a, a teacher. Uh, by then, I should say, he had, uh, uh, he had uh, formally affiliated with the Quakers. Now, he had gone to Quaker churches in, uh, in England, where a large uh, amount of Quakers were, where they started, and come to America, but he had not joined, per se. But I often say the Quakers were just like the black church. If you step in that door three times, you automatically member, whether you sign anything or not. And so he became a, 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 a Quaker, started teaching at a school for girls. Now, why did he become a Quaker? Well, there were certain ideas about Quakerism that, uh, 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 that had a tremendous impact of him. One was the, uh, 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 the uh, notion that there's God in every human being. I don't need the word of the preacher to get the word of God. I can get it myself. Uh, one against the notion of original sin, which means one does not uh, inherit uh, the sins of the father. Neither do you inherit the wealth. So therefore, a black or Persian slave does not inherit the slavery. As we've known before by other uh, earlier philosophers, one, a slave is a condition one is to be born in. Going back to the idea of Aristotle and Plato, it could be the idea of, uh, of a slave, uh, slavery being imposed upon those who are, uh, are weakest. He did not believe in natural slavery. The other was the quick idea against the ostentation as an excessive wealth. Uh, the other one, of course, we know best from Quakers in America is the peace principle uh, against uh, uh, a war for the fighting of all measures to a change. So he developed that idea, and from that, he walked the walls in Philadelphia, and he walks, as he walks the walls of Philadelphia, he sees black men and girls and, 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 and men and boys enchained. And he found something uh, in common uh, with them. So he uh, made his life uh, to free uh, uh, these blacks. At the same time, uh, eight years after he started teaching in the girls' school, he, found, he uh, started teaching Quaker boys and girls in his home uh, on his extra time with his extra money and became a phenomenal uh, individual of that. 
Professor Jackson, how widespread was slavery in Philadelphia in the 1730s, 1740s? <clears throat> well, Philadelphia uh, uh, had slaves. It is no nowhere as widespread as in the South, but there are slaves. Benjamin Rush owned slaves. Benjamin Franklin owned slaves. All the, uh, the Hafalutans uh, uh, owned slaves. They're about 3,000. Uh, 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 they are there over time. Uh, people uh, have now, <clears throat> of course, the crop, the nature of crops and everything in Pennsylvania is not as colder. Uh, uh, you have a large uh, white uh, workforce, and so therefore the slavery may not uh, be as much needed. Uh, but there were slaves there. I should tell you, though, that, uh, uh, that most times people identify the, uh, the Quakers with always being against slavery, and, and it's not the case. It took a long time, uh, even in a place that did not have slavery as, uh, as, as, as abundant as Philadelphia or Chester, Pennsylvania, and the places outside there. The Quakers made their first uh, gesture in 1688 and made a, a, a decree, the Germantown Protest, uh, against slavery, and, but it was over 100 years, almost 100 years later, when the final decree was made. You see, this is what would happen. Someone would own a slave, and someone would say, uh, uh, we pass a, a, a resolution that says people should, uh, should uh, uh, a query, they said, we should get rid of the, the slaves. And so you go back next year and said, have you relieved yourself of the slaves? And the person would say, no, I have not yet. I need this. I'm not economic labor. And then you go back next year, next year, next year. And the Quakers didn't, didn't have a, a, a point of expelling those. They did, however, expel those who uh, fought against slavery. And uh, uh, the biggest example is, is, the, is the great Benjamin Lay, who had come from, uh, in, from uh, England and then gone from Colchester, England, and gone uh, to Barbados. And Benjamin Lay in 1731 uh, wrote something called All Slave Keepers. Well, a big event happened in, in, in uh, 1739. Benjamin Lay goes into a church, and he has in this great uh, 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 broad coat, and under it he has a, a, a pouch of pokenberry juice. And he stabbed the pokenberry juice and said, I stabbed myself just as you killed these slaves, and the juice uh, came all out as if blood and they expelled him uh, for his anti quick action. He then went and uh, kidnapped a young white girl and uh, took him to, he lived in a cave. He was, uh, he, he was, he was quite eccentric, uh, uh, as I say, and they, in a cave and, and he kept the little girl. He didn't hurt her and he just wanted the whites to know what it felt like if your child was kidnapped and he was uh, uh, an uh, early vegetarian. And there were other actions of people like he and Ralph Sanderford and others. Uh, the next big quake action came only until 1748 and, and that's when uh, John Woolman the great John Woolman, who was sort of the, 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 the romantic leader of, uh, of the Quakers. He had an aura about him. He traveled uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the country uh, protesting against slavery. And he and Benazay wrote something called the Epistle, the first uh, formal epistle. Now, what happens in the Quaker religion is that uh, England is still under the control of, uh, America is still under the control of England. So the Quakers in Philadelphia would have to send their ideas to, Phil to England in order to get them accepted. They'd write something, but it was no good until the English Quakers, the fathers, uh, uh, sent back and said it's okay. So they had to go through the English uh, church. And finally, in 1748, there was a, 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 a one step, but still not much. And so in 1750, 10 years later, they're trying to pass a decree against slavery to demand that every, all the Quakers, and they wouldn't. And up to the front comes Benazay weeping. And he says, Ethiopia shall soon stretch your hands unto thee. The Psalms 23rd, it's, it's a famous uh, a psalm now in, in most churches, Ethiopia, Africa, Abyssinia. And uh, he carried the day, and they, they passed this resolution in 1658. Uh, a couple of years later, in 17, uh, 1758, in 1762, he wrote his first real uh, anti slavery pamphlet, Some Historical Accounts of Africa. And he became known throughout the Atlantic world, in America, French, and all over, by his writings against slavery. And what did he, how did he come about these writings? He, he had three components. One is the Quaker religion. And next, he studied Scottish Enlightenment philosophy. Now, what do I mean by that? That in the 1750s and 60s and 70s, there was a branch of, uh, of Enlightenment philosophy based in Scotland. We know of Adam Smith, but there were ones before them, Francis Hutchinson, uh, James Foster, George Wallace. And I often say, uh, I joke, I grew up in the South, not our George Wallace, I mean, not George Wallace of Alabama in the 50s and 60s. And uh, he used those philosophies because they took from the ideas of Montesquieu, but what they did particularly was out of philosophy, they developed the notion that no one could hold another person in commercia. You see, John Locke had written that if a person is someone's property, they had the right to buy and sell him. And what these philosophers did, it says, no, uh, you do not have the right to hold any human being. And so he used these philosophers and also that they had the right to re revolt. The big question then became whether or not these uh, people were human beings. And so Benazay went from, from Scottish philosophy to the study of Africa. And he started reading everything he could on, on Africa. He read uh, uh, several things, mainly uh, 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 tracks of slave traders and, 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 and travelers. Now, one would say, how can you read what a slave trader could say? And it, I, I often say, it's like my grandmother said, every, out of every lie there's a grain of truth. But what he did, 
was read not just the slave traders, but the people who went to Africa working for the Royal African Company or the French uh, uh, nautical company and things like that and started studying these tracks, their notes and things. And some of those wrote vividly about the flora and the fauna.